Tonight, <clears throat> we're going to study for a little while. The Lord just started ministering my heart. Gird up the loins of your of your mind. Oh, yeah. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now this is pretty interesting. In 1 Peter 1 and 13, look that up. Gird up the loins of your mind. 1 Peter 1 and 13. And that's where we're going to start as our reference. 1 Peter 1 and 13. Who has that? Do you have that one? Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now, does anybody have any idea what it means to gird up the loins of your mind? Well, to me, it's like when they tell you, if you think about the girding up, that's what they used to do, the men used to... I'm going to explain that in a minute. I'm asking for anybody that has any other definition other than the actual. Do anybody know what it means to gird up your loins of your mind? Oh, I know what that means. Oh, what's it mean? It means to, well, be prepared. Okay, All right. It means to, it's like you hold your pants up, you... Kind of like that. Okay. It sounds really good in my head, I'll tell you. Well, <laughs> this was actually an expression that was taken from that day. Because they used to wear robes. Pretty long and flowing robes. And they'd almost go down to their ankles. So, everybody wore a belt. They had some kind of a belt. But if they were going to go fast, if they were going to move, if they were going to run, for any reason, they would reach down between their legs grab that robe, pull it up and stick it down in their belt so it looked like a culotte affair. So they grabbed the back side of the robe, pull it to the front, stick it down in so you had little leggings on both sides. The whole reason to have this manner of dress, girding up your loins, was to keep, get the robe away from your feet so that you didn't stumble when you're running. That's what it means to gird up the loins of your mind. Don't get stumbled while you're running. Don't be stumbled while you're running. No distractions. Don't have any abstract, uh, distractions. distractions or obstructions. The, today, we call it something like this. If we're going to get up distracted, distraction out of the way, any obstructions out of the way, we say it like this. Roll up your sleeves. That's what we say today. Gird up your loins was something they said at that day. Gird up your loins. So, very important, racers and warriors were always girding up their loins. Girding up your loins. Girding up the loins of your mind means don't have anything as a distraction. Don't let anything get you off track. Don't stumble with a thought. My Bible says that girding up your loins means prepare for action. Preparedness, prepare mm-hmm. for action. Mm-hmm. That's the highest form of preparation. Mm-hmm. With our society filled with loose morals, it's filled with loose. It's on television, you know, 50 years ago. They would cringe at the th- things you can see online today. It's like, oh my goodness, stuff on TV, the, what they show, what they speak. You know, when television first started, you could not say a bad word. Mm-hmm. They would shut the entire station down. Well, now there's bad words spoken all the time. It's like no big deal. Looseness is all over the place. Laxity is everywhere. Do you need to get the phone? Doctrinally speaking, there are much fighting against the Spirit because what you see and what you hear is definitely appalled to what the Lord said. This is a standard against God. 
There's carelessness against the spirituality of God. There's sloppiness and the lack of worship and devotion is real evident. When they talk about Christians on television, what do you hear? Jokes. Jokes. They don't minister. They don't talk about them being good. If you hear a pastor's on there for any reason, he's got a lot of problems. There's always pastors with problems, people with are Christians that got problems. Unless, of course, you are got, got a real specialty show that you're watching and they're talking about Christians with some kind of flair. It's always the preacher's daughter or, you know, friends of the family that ran off with the preacher's kids or whatever. But the Bible says, gird up your loins of your mind. Get your mind out of that situation. Get prepared for something different. How many have taken the time to really get ourselves prepared for something different in the loins of our minds? I mean, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. Get prepared. Put yourself in a racing or a warrior's position to fight properly for the things of God. Now, this is interesting. Girding up the loins... And I found several definitions for girding up the loins. Girding up the loins, number one, it means an earnestness or serious state of mind. An earnestness or serious state of mind. Well, does that mean that you can't joke around? No, that doesn't mean you can't joke around. It just means that you're serious. There's certain things in your life ought to be serious. Your relationship with God. You know, I've had people tell me, well, I'm not going to your church. You know, Christians don't have fun. Can't do that. Well, there are certain churches, there are so many rituals that you can't have fun and be at church. But the earnest and serious state of mind was something that really caught me because I had to look that up to see Where's that earnest and seriousness mean? Well, here's what it says in the definition. It says, we've been called to be a holy people. Wow. You mean we ought to keep that in our mind all the time? You know, if Christians kept the thought that they're a holy people, we'd be a whole lot different. We'd act different. We'd talk different. We'd be different. We are called to be a holy people Holy and pure and separate. Separate. In 2 Corinthians 6, it says in verse 16, And what agreement has the temple of God with the idols? For you are the temple of the living God. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? As God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among the world. Come out from among them, and be separate, says the Lord. Be separate. One translation says, be different. Be different. Be separate. Do not touch the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I would say that in our society, there's definitely a lot of unclean things. Be separate. We need to be, I, I put it like this, conscious of our faith. Mm -hmm. All the time. Anybody ever been to a sports arena, watched a sports game? Mm -hmm. Do you think they were conscious of their faith? No. I don't think so. <laughs> Anybody ever been to amusement park? Mm -hmm. You think anyone there is conscious of their faith? Mm -hmm. You know, folks have trouble even stopping to pray over their food. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, as a matter of fact, you know, I stop and pray over my food. And when I do, I say, let's bow our heads and we're going to pray. And I'm, I just do it like that. I think we're okay. Well, sometimes I've been prompted, take a quick gander at what's going on. And so I kind of look up, and I see people going, because <laughs> they're, they're not bowing, their heads and their eyes aren't closed, they're just, and most times, interestingly enough, even if people pray at home, they won't be conscious of their faith in front of other people. They won't pray when they're out at a restaurant, they just don't do that. And you say, really? No, I'm serious. We're talking about 90% of the Christians. 
It just, it doesn't come up because they've been called to be holy and called to be separate. And it's our duty and our honor to get to praise the Lord, even in our prayer time. So we need to roll up our sleeves and act like Christians. We need to gird up our loins and really act like Christians. In other words, we need to mean business with this stuff. I mean, if we're called a Christian, we ought to mean business with it. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody in here have any business dealings? Really? You have business dealings? What do they call you in business? People that I work with and yes. that I deal with, yes. uh, they tell me that I'm smart and I know what I'm doing. So are you a salesperson? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes. Sometimes. What sometimes else? Sometimes I'm a salesperson, sometimes I'm a mentor, sometimes I'm a leader, sometimes hmm. I'm a developer. I see. So you try to be whatever they need you to be, yes. and by doing that, they can respect you in that position. Right. That's where most Christians are is that we need to understand folks are looking for a mentor and a leader and a developer. They want to be able to say, yeah, I've learned a lot from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you have clients, they can learn from you. Mm -hmm. They say that. They say, I've learned a lot. I appreciate your help. We ought to think about our daily life and everything we go through in the same manner. I'm a teacher. I'm a trainer. Somebody needs the help. Mm -hmm. I've been sent by God. I've got a call on my life. If any person has become a Christian, the Bible says you've been made a new creature in Christ. Mm -hmm. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Don't you know, folks want to have new things. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're saying, you know, what do you do? Don't have to hide it. Don't put it under a barrel. Don't put a cover on it. You need to be what he called you to be. And now, secondly, girding. Girding, gird up the loins of your mind. Secondly, this was the second definition. Preparedness. Preparedness. And here's the final part of that definition. It said you ought to get prepared like a warrior does for battle. Well, you know, the Lord told me years and years ago that just like, like a warrior does for battle... If you're like going to take a trip, if you're going to do something in your life, you need to be prayerful over those times mm. because you're preparing yourself, you're preparing that path, you're preparing the circumstances you're going to go to or going to be encountered with or whatever. You need to be... You know, when I was yeah. reading through this part, that preparedness, I mentioned it Sunday... But the Lord has been quickening me over and over. He said, prepare for the favor you have not yet received. Mm. All right. mm -hmm. So he said, start praying for that favor. Mm -hmm. Favor on the phone. Favor with the people. Favor with the bank. Favor with Amen. everything you come in contact with. Because what's missing most often, we could get through life if we just had enough favor. Right. Anything is possible if you have enough favor. Where we've missed it is we don't get up and get prepared. We slide by. We make it. And we tell folks, man, I just barely made it. Well, wait a minute. We know the word preparing it's caring. is caring. So I have had people invite me over and they say, one time a fellow that was my mentor he invited me to come and fellowship with his family. I was just in college, but he, he was an older man and married, and several kids, and, he, and they all lived at the house. And he said, we're going to make dinner for everybody, and we want you to come. I was so honored. My heart was thrilled. I didn't have very many home-cooked meals when I went to college, for heaven's sake. I was looking forward to that. And I went to his house. I drove over there, made all the arrangements. I got there 15 minutes early, for heaven's sake, but I sat out in the car because I wanted to be conscious of the time. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I was supposed to be there at 6.30. I was there at 6.30. It wasn't 6.15. I just looking forward to the meal. And so I got up and finally walked up there and knocked right on the door at 6.30. 
I mean to tell you, he said, oh, welcome, thanks for coming, come on in. I came in, him and his daughter and his two sons, and they talked and back and forth, and his wife came through, and about dinner's almost ready. I, oh, yes, I was excited, we're going to have something. And we got in and all sat at the table. Now, he's got three kids, him and his wife, and we sat down, and he made six hot dogs. And he slid the hot dog plate over. They had, they didn't have buns. They had bread you fold over. Now, I don't mind that, but he didn't have any chips, no beans, or anything like I hate going out to eat somewhere and my stomach saying, you cheated me. I, <laughs> and so I had to leave there and go get something to eat. Because preparing is caring. So from that point, I never went to eat at that man's house again because he wasn't prepared for me. And I felt awkward about being there. We went one time, if you remember that <laughs> doctor's house, we went to a doctor's, wealthy. big, wealthy, wealthy doctor. doctor's home. Gated. I'm not talking about gated community. I'm talking about gated for his house. We had to get a code to get in his house. We went up the driveway all the way up to this big mansion. We got to his house and he told us all these different things he'd done, the world travels he'd been on and all this stuff. And we sat there and he had brought a little dish of dip out and put the little dish of dip out. And After we'd been there, we'd been there a couple hours before he brought that out. We was hungry. We hadn't eaten all day. And so he brought a few chips out and we were eating that stuff. I said, I don't know what this is, but you know, I'm hungry. So we're eating away and... And finally, his wife said, you know, it's 8 o'clock. Don't you think it's time for dinner? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, where's, the, where's the dining room? So we're heading. She goes, no, no, no. We got to go by the kitchen first. I said, well, maybe the staff are in there cooking or something like that, you know. So we walked by and she said, no, no staff. She opened up the refrigerator and she said, what kind of TV dinner do you want? I'm serious. This is a wealthy man's house, and they're getting a TV dinner. And I said, preparing is caring. You don't care at all. Now, if that's the way I would think about things on this earth, don't you know that's the way the Lord thinks about our preparedness mm -hmm. in Him? Preparing is caring. When people say they didn't have time to read their scripture, but they had time to watch four hours of television, preparing is caring. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking we need to rethink this. we got to get our mind ready to be engaged in battle. We're in a war, folks. If you know it or not, this world is not our friend. The, the devil is loosed on this earth and he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. Our job is to get ourselves ready, get our battle mind ready. It's always the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. There is no kingdom of man. I've had people tell me, well, there's three kingdoms, kingdom of God, kingdom of the devil, and kingdom of man. There is no kingdom of man. You're either on the kingdom of God or you're with the kingdom of the devil. There is no kingdom of man because it, it's not going to stand. Mm -hmm. You got one or the other. You don't have a kingdom of man. And so we need to get ourselves ready as if we're going to war. Now I'm telling you, is there a way to prepare like we've never prepared before? I'm talking about study. I'm talking about praying. I'm talking about applying the scriptures to our life. Amen. Applying. Application. Last night, we got a text from someone that said, well, I understand about certain things, but how do you apply that scripture to your life? It was called, the scripture was about peace. Well, how do you apply it? You walk in peace. <laughs> well, it's not the peace that you can conjure up in your head is the peace you conjure up from your heart this is the peace that passes understanding 
That's what quickens your heart and your mind in Christ. Now, some people don't understand that, but we need to get a different knowledge of the Word of God so that we get a keen edge Mm -hmm. on the devil. We need to get a sharp attack against him. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds. Now, my question is, are we using the weapons we know of? If we know there's weapons and they're mighty to pull down strongholds, Mm -hmm. all of us have dealt with a stronghold at one time or another. Stronghold of finances, stronghold of false friends, stronghold of family members, strongholds of healing, strongholds of hundreds of things. Mm -hmm. The devil likes to bring strongholds. But the Bible says that we have got weapons that overcome these strongholds. Mm -hmm. And if there are weapons, don't you think we ought to get prepared to use them? That just makes sense. We ought to get prepared. So girding up your loins of your mind means that you've already prepared. You're getting yourself prepared to use your weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the weapons of our warfare? Joy. Okay, we have that weapon. We have a weapon of joy. Mm -hmm. We have a weapon of joy. Because a merry heart does good like a medicine. Mm -hmm. We can overcome the works of darkness. Anything else? What other weapons do we have? Praise. We have a weapon of praise. Praise is actually a powerful power. Don't ever ever underestimate the power of praise. Because it can change a situation Mm -hmm. in no time. Where we have difficulty as Christians, we don't make praise the optimum reward to God. Mm -hmm. We go, well, I don't even feel like praising right now. (laughs) That don't feel like it. You know, when you don't feel like it, it's probably the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Because we're not going by feelings. We're going by Christian attitude. We're going by do it anyway. Anybody ever not feel like going to work? (laughs) (laughs) Did you go anyway? Yeah. How come? Obligated. Oh, do you know? Well, sometimes you don't go even if the money's good. It's like... You just get, there has to be some kind of benefit that makes you do what you're called to do even though you don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. You got to recognize your benefit. Mm -hmm. The benefits of Christian walk is that he says you are overcomers. And, but you've got to stay in that attitude. I'm an overcomer. You've got to stay in the attitude. I'm reading the word to get a keen edge on the devil. Now, Ephesians 6 and verse 17 says it like this. Ephesians 6 and verse 17. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, Mm -hmm. which is the word of God. So what do we have as a weapon? We have the word of God. If you read the Bible, it says it's the only weapon that we carry. The rest of it is guarding. Guarding our minds, guarding our loins, guarding our protection. uh, protection. Uh But the weapon that we've got is the Word. Mm -hmm. Even the shield is just there for protection. But you've got the weapon, which is your sword. You need to get your sword out. You need to get handy with that sword. The word. It should be always on your lips. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're dealing with situations, instead of going, "Mm, mm, 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 mm." come on, we've all done it. We go, oh, this. mm, mm, mm." When we're grunting like that, that doesn't change anything. We got to use the word on that situation. Use the word on that situation. With the sword in your hand, you can slice through false philosophies. With the sword in your hand, you work through all the works of the devil. Mm -hmm. Just as feet can be stumbling over robes, the mind can stumble over fears. The mind can stumble over false teachings. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. The Bible says to watch out for those that are false teachers. Watch out for those that have given false direction. Even the apostles were praised because they found those folks that were false apostles Mm -hmm. and giving false 
words. That causes many people to stumble. The false words. False words. Do you know there's a whole lot of false teaching going on right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know it's been going on for years? I'd even venture to say since Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. Because Jesus came as the Messiah. And false teaching is like this. I don't need to be there. He's not really, it's not all that. You can get saved a lot of ways. Anybody ever heard that? You can get lots of ways to get saved. I even heard it on TV. Heard a preacher. A well-known, a well-known preacher. Okay. Saying Jesus is not the only way. There's lots of ways to get saved. Mm-hmm. I'm I had to sit back. I said, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, dude. His falseness has spread to your heart there. What's going on? Because this false stuff mm-hmm. needs to be girded up with truth. Right. The word of God is truth. If it That's doesn't right. match up with the word, it's not the truth. That's right. You've got the sword of the spirit. You've got the truth. The truth always prevails. The truth Puts the devil back in his place. The truth, no matter what he tells you, it's not going to work this time. Don't lie to me like that. You liar. Mm -hmm. You liar. I read the word, says I win. And you're going to hell. That's what it says. That's where you're going to end up. And the third part of girding. You ready for this? This is the third definition. Third definition. Third definition of girding up the loins of your mind was determination. Determination. Do you know that a lot of times you can defeat the works of darkness just because you're determined to? Yes. You're determined. End of story. I've seen <laughs> runners and and racers that are just determined mm-hmm. and they win the race. I've seen teams that play football. They've been talked to. They've been told that the other team is great, that what they can do, fine. However, we're determined to win. And they just go out there and somehow just change the whole thing around because their determination. Mm-hmm. Determination is when your mind and your faith are totally resolved to see this thing done. Right. Amen. Totally resolved. We did that when I was in that me- medical facility. Oh my goodness. Like we've been there for so long and it came to a point where we said, I'm done. That's it. I'm out of here. And that day we were. We were determined. We were determined. We prayed. We got the, we got the faith of God at that moment Mm -hmm. and determined whatever it takes, you're going to have to move mountains and just get it over. And the doctors were saying, you'll need to be here seven more days minimum. Maybe Mm ten. Seven more days minimum. And we were determined. We heard the word of the Lord. (coughs) Faith got in our heart and we said no. And I'll tell you what, it was like the doors completely swung open. Everybody that needed to be there was boom, 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 right one after the other. And finally they said, well, you're going to have to see this one. Oh, they're already here. And you're going to have to see them. Oh, there they are now. And you're going to have to see this one. It may may take them a couple more days till they get here. Oh, there they are now. And they just went boom, 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 boom. And they signed the release. And the doctor didn't even show up. But he signed it uh, proxy because it was on the phone. Said now we can't. I can't be there right now, but let them go. And we were done. The deal was, if you didn't have an official release, then your insurance wouldn't pay for it. Mm -hmm. Really, Really. you have to have an official release. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they say you might get caught up in it again, and we'll have to pay it again. Mm -hmm. So, God. With his power, determined by the dropping the gift of faith and saying that's it. When you've got a gift of faith, you can get determined to do anything. Yeah. You get dropped on you a gift of faith, you're determined to do anything. And the Christian that hears the word must get in that same policy of determination. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says, be a doer. In James 1 and 22, it says it like this. Be a doer of the word. Mm -hmm. Not just a hearer, because you deceive yourself. 
Anyone that is a hearer of the word and is not a doer of the word is just like a man that observes his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and then goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. And that happens to Christians all the time. That's why they hesitate in being who they're supposed to be other than when they're somewhere where they can see their reflection, like at church. But if they're out in the world, sometimes they just keep it to themselves. I think that we need to be a little more vocal. Now is the time to act. During this season, we need to start really praising God. I've had people tell me, Happy Holidays! Happy Holidays! I say, you know, there's only one more holiday, and that's Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! And they go, oh, well, we're not saying that anymore. Well, I understand that, but I am. Amen. Merry Christmas! They asked me what my name was at the uh, coffee shop. I said, Merry Christmas. So they put it on the cup. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was tired of them saying happy holidays. So now they had to say Merry Christmas. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> and you got to act at this time. you got to act. And this is the area. I, I understand this. Now catch this. At this season, this area belongs to the Lord. We need to act like it's so. This area belongs to the Lord. It takes determination to apply the Lordship of Jesus in everything that we do. It takes determination. It takes determination. Because there's not a lot of areas that apply the Lordship of Jesus. Not our educational area. We need to apply the Lordship of mm -hmm. Jesus. In some home lives... It's not talked about. It's not shared. But we need to apply the Lordship of Jesus. In the justice system, hey, if you've ever had to go to court for anything, I'm going to tell you what. They might say, put your hand on the Bible, but that's about it. <laughs> We're not talking about justice. We're talking about 12 people that can't figure out how to get out of jury duty. Are you with me? <laughs> that's, no, that's not your peers. That's people that are you know left over because they couldn't, they couldn't get out of it. But the Lord says he wants us to put back our lordship of Jesus, even in our government, in our medicine, in society in general. Because when we do, we brought back to the Lord the girding up of our loins, mm -hmm. of our mind. It's in everything. It's in everything. Philippians 2, it says in verse 10, that the, at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We need to start that now. There's going to come a time when every knee's going to bow. But I'll tell you what. On more than one occasion, I've had to praise the Lord and knees bow. Because they were praising their God, but I praised... By saying their foul words and foul things, I got loud. And I was praising God on an elevator, and I was praising the Lord. And they were going to go up past where I was getting off, but they got off on the next floor, didn't they? Because mm -hmm. they said, Whoop, and they got quiet and got off. I said, don't you dare come around me with that stuff anymore. They would come out of the bar anyway, and there's all kinds of four sheets gone. Are you with me? And, <laughs> and they was letting it all loose. But the Lord... I praised him anyway, and they got off. I'll tell you what, we got to make sure that every knee bows and tongues confess that Christ is Lord. It is our duty. It is our duty and our command that knees bow and that tongues confess. And the best way to start is with yourself. If you're confessing the Lord and your knees are bowed to the Lord and everything, people are going to start saying, you know, we need to watch it around her. We need, we need to keep ourselves right. And pretty soon they're getting right themselves. Mm -hmm. Amen. Number four, girding up the loin. Number four. <laughs> now, this is funny, but girding up the loins of your mind, one of the definitions was 
putting your life together. I said it like this, pull your life together. <laughs> Pulling your life together. It's an act of consecration. The single most important duty that Christians have is to bring glory to God. It's your consecrated duty. Mm -hmm. Pull your life together. It's your consecrated duty. We're supposed to act as the same character of God. We've been made in His likeness. We've been made in His image. And does anybody know what God's character uh the very references to God's character, do you know what his character is? It's found in Galatians. Mm -hmm. It tells what his character is. In Galatians 5 and verse 22, it says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Mm -hmm. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. This is the very nature and the character of God. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5.22 Against such there's no law. 5.22 and 23. 24 says this, Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them. And since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. This is pulling your life together. Let's not be conceited or provoke one another or jealous with anyone. And let me add this. We got to forgive. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. We got to forgive people. Man, this season is a season of forgiving. We got to forgive people. This is pulling our life together. Focusing our energy and our talent and our time and our knowledge and our possessions, everything we have, pulling our life together for the Lord. To, it's sort of like this. Anybody ever taken a magnifying glass and, and got it just right so you can get the sun to go through it and you can actually start a fire with a magnifying glass or a lens off your glasses? Mm -hmm. You can get the fire just exactly focused in a pinpoint laser. It'll start a fire. Hmm. Now, if you didn't know that, when you're caught in the woods by yourself and you need a fire, <laughs> find somebody with glasses. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, that kind of magnifying life is when you finally pull your life together in every resource of your life. And you determine to face life and do battle with the sword in your hand. You're ready to go to work for the Lord. Pull off all those things that hinder your thought life. Anybody got anything that's tried to corrupt your thought life and keep it tangled up? Sometimes work does that. Sometimes our relatives do that. They get all in there and it gets all tangled up and it gets all messy. That's to try to keep you from being keen and sharp mm -hmm. in the Word of God. <coughs> so if you're dealing with healing, you need to get it sharp. If you're dealing with relationships, you need to get it sharp. We need a sharp, clear understanding so that we won't stumble. Mm -hmm. We need to be strong in God so we won't stumble. Now... Those are the reasons, those are the definitions of girding, but now I want to give you some things you can do to gird up your loins of your mind. Things you can do to gird up the loins of your mind. And I said this before, as I start, I'm going to say it again. Number one, remove strongholds. The devil's doing everything he can to keep you tangled up and he always tries to bring some kind of stronghold. He tries to bring a stronghold with you being so busy you don't have time. He tries to bring a stronghold miscommunication so that you will not work in tandem with one another. He wants to keep you opposed. He makes you have all kinds of problems. One trouble after another trouble after another. You say, I just want it to stop. 
you know, as long as you're on this world, it's not going to stop. <laughs> you're going to have troubles. But 2 Corinthians 10, it starts in verse 4, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then he tells us what to do. Cast down imaginations. Those things get squirrely in our head. They're the things that tangle up our walk with God. We got to get our head sharp. So cast down imaginations. Cast down those high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God or the word of God. And bring into captivity every thought, every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. That means since Christ and the word are one, it's got to be obedient to the word. It's got to line up with the word. So you got to remove strongholds. Satan's strongholds are thoughts about loose ends in your life. Anybody got any loose ends in your life? I'm talking about stuff that you know you've been working on or folks that are not quite the, the way they're supposed to be or things that you know you're supposed to be doing the next step in your life and you haven't done it yet. There's so many loose things that are going on. I kind of look at it like this. You have, Let's say you have a hundred thoughts that are going on in your head. Now that that's probably... Not enough, because scientists say you have about 60,000 thoughts a day. Hmm. Let's say you have a 100 thoughts right now. How many of them are on God? <laughs> how many are thinking about how hard your chair is? <laughs> I mean, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying. How, how many are thinking about, is the wind stopped? Is it been blowing? Is my car wet? Am I going to have some wet on the inside? Is the dust going to get on my window? I mean, we got all these thoughts and they're going on all the time. Because the devil wants to get us tangled up in our thoughts lives. And we need to stop these loose ends. The, how I do it all the time, all the time, every day. I make a list. I make a list. Some people say, I'll put it on my phone. Fine, but I like it on my list so I can cross it off. Mm -hmm. Then it's not in my mind anymore. When the devil comes and says, I want you to think about that. Think about that. I go, mm -mm -mm. no. The Bible says, think about good and lovely, good and important, virtue and praise. Doesn't say, think on what I'm going to get for dinner. It says, think about good and lovely, good and important, virtue and praise. I don't have to think on that thought. How am I going to get my car fixed? Where's that going to get done? I don't have to think on that stuff. I wrote it down. It's not in my head anymore. And the devil goes, I'll get somebody not so smart. So I'm just telling you, I think that's a smart idea to write it down. Just put it on a piece of paper. So the strongholds come as thoughts. We need to correct wrong thinking. Anything that you have got wrong thinking on, you need to fix it. Because the devil's using that to tangle you up. Mm -hmm. You would need to allow the word to fix it, right. not let your thoughts hinder it. Mm -hmm. All right? God is trying to help you to eliminate loose ends in your thinking. Number two. Stay submitted to God. Now, that's a pretty big statement. But James chapter 4, it says in verse 6, James 4, in verse 6, it says, He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Now, let's get that pattern down right. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. It doesn't just say resist the devil, he'll, he'll flee. Because without the submitting to God, you don't have any power on your side. Right. Submit to God, resist the devil. We try to resist the devil all the time. Without the power of God. Right. we got to be submitted to God. And here's how you do it. Verse 8. It says, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Man, why would he say something like that when he's talking so good about drawing near to God? Oh, draw near to God, draw near to God. That's so good. Then he says, clean your hands, you sinners. <laughs> and what he's saying there is don't let anything be on your hands or in your head except for things that are pure. Purify your hearts. Then he goes on to say, you double-minded. Why would he say that? Because you have thoughts of God and thoughts that are not. Thoughts of God, and then thoughts that are not. And it happens all the time, no matter what you're dealing with. If you're dealing with something, you know God's going to come through, you know it, 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 and then you go, I'm having so much, I'm trying to keep my head right, I can't, I'm just, I just got to help me keep my head right. Because we do it real good, and then we don't. And then we do it real good, and then we don't. And the Lord says, you have got to stay, sub stay submitted to God. Submit to God. It eases willpower and self-control. Anybody ever try to do something by willpower? You say, I'm on diet. I'm going to use my willpower. Come on, diet's a good one. I'm on diet. I'm going to use my willpower. How long does that last? Come on, man. Is that not, you, like, you got five minutes out of yours? You got some serious willpower. Three days. Wow, you got three days? Till I get hungry. Yeah. The moment I get hungry, then where to go? I'm eating three candy bars, and I go, oh man, I'm on time. <laughs> because when you're submitted to God, it eases your willpower and it puts you back in self control. When you're submitted to God, that's one of the characteristics of God, is that it, He brings you self-control. Mm. So you got to be submitted to God to take on His characteristic. Mm -hmm. sure. It's hard to gird up the loins of your mind unless you're close to God. Because if you're away from God, I don't think those people gird up the loins of anything. Are you with me? Their mind's loose. Their morals are loose, their characters loose, they're not girded. Mm -hmm. Don't be double-minded. You need to hear the word, you need to meditate on the word, you need to speak the word, you need to stand on the word. Without that, it's just a good thought, but it never went anywhere. You got to hear the word, you got to meditate the word, you got to speak the word, and you got to stand on the word. Number three, number three, do not, do not for any reason, do not let your attitude get defeated. Isn't that a good one? Because <laughs> you know what we do? We do like this. I kind of feel sorry for myself. We don't say it out loud, <laughs> but we go through fits of sorry. I'm sorry for myself. We usually have it happen when somebody's done something and they go, well, if I die, you're going to feel sorry. <laughs> you're going to be really sorry. Because <laughs> we're just murdering at that point. Uh -huh. And we let our attitude get defeated. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So what's he telling us? Do you know that that's the way all faith works? Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Confession is made unto salvation. Our attitude is affected by what goes through our minds. If we let it sit in there, it doesn't help it. We need to take a shovel, go on up in there, and get the stuff out of there that doesn't belong. Stuff like fear, and doubt, and anxiety, and disappointment. It tears at the loins of our mind. Fears, 
try to grip us all the time. All the time. Doubt tries to sink in. That's why he says, why did you doubt you double-minded? Because it always tries to grip us. We think we're doing so good, and then we go, well, what do you think? <laughs> I hope so, don't you? That, and we let ourselves do it like that. We need to take a good review of ourselves and see if there's any area we need to change. Any area that we need to change. And then, with a purposeful heart, make the change. Mm -hmm. With a purposeful heart. Number four. We need to delight in the laws of the Lord. In other words, delight in the word. I delight myself in the word. Psalms 1, verse 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but delights in the law of the Lord, delights in the word of God. And his law, his word, he will meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bring forth its fruit in season whose leaf will not wither, and my very favorite part, and whatever he does shall prosper. Wow, this is a good one. Mm -hmm. It's talking about delight. I delight myself in the Lord. You know, very few people really delight themselves in God. And the Bible says we need to delight that. That's one way a well-girded mind can stand strong because it's on the word. A well-girded mind. It stands strong. It's a prepared mind. It's a diligent mind. It's a strong mind. This kind of prepared mind will prevent you from falling apart when you're dealing with tough times. <laughs> and don't we get a little bit, mm, we do fall apart in tough times. When things get really tough, we do everything we can to stay together. But boy, golly gee, we we give in a little sometimes. Well, a lot. And we need to stand strong during tough times. Number five. Let your spirit dominate your mind. Now, we are a spirit. We have a soul. That's mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body. So we're three parts. But let your spirit dominate your mind. John 6 and verse 63, it says, It is the spirit that gives life. Mm -hmm. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life. It is the spirit that gives life. And when the devil comes to try to defeat us, the spirit of God empowers you. He empowers you and brings you to victory. The Bible says he always causes you to triumph for those that are in Christ Jesus. And walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Always causes you to triumph. So he wants to bring you to victory. Romans 8 and verse 6. Romans 8 and verse 6. It says, to be carnally minded is death. Mm -hmm. But to be spiritually minded, it's life and peace. Mm -hmm. Now somebody asks, what's the application of peace? Well, here we go. It's when you walk in peace, that's where your spirit controls your mind. It's taking priority over your mind. The spirit, the spirit dominates your mind. So in this season... We need to serve God and gird up the loins of our mind. 
In other words, we need to be better Christians. <laughs> Gird up the loins of mine. And that's all I have for tonight.